Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the attendees. Uh, I'm uh, Mrs. Alexandra Duval. I'm uh, the VP Marketing and Communication for Peter Surgical. I'm responsible for education. Today, uh, Peter Surgical is pleased to have to facilitate a new webinar from Peter's Academy. Uh, Peter's Academy was born last year, considering that uh, Peter Surgical can help surgical community to better exchange and learn from each other about local challenges and expertise. Today, we are very honored to welcome for the webinars dedicated to the Mitra valve repair, Professor Jean-François Obadia as the moderator, Professor Tawisak from Thailand, Dr. Vijit from India, Dr. Greenberg from France, and Professor Duns from Germany. Uh, before I leave the floor to our moderators and the speakers, let me share with you a few uh, elements from this webinar. Um, first of all, um, the, the, the agenda of today, um, if something is okay. Yeah, oops, uh, sorry. Yeah, here we are. Uh, Professor Tawisak will start presenting uh, his innovative approach from rheumatic and non-rheumatic mitral repair. Uh, it will be followed by Dr. Vijit explaining the type of valvulopathy and repair techniques in India. And uh, we will leave uh, on the talk later on uh, to Dr. Greenberg on the focus on MIS approach, explaining the peripheral cannulation and classical repairs. And we will end this webinar by the talk from Professor Dons on a complex repair on MIS. This webinar will be complete in English. Uh, before each session, uh, we will share with you one survey where uh, you will have uh, one question uh, to participate. Uh, this is normal, you are all in mute. And uh, if you want to ask for a question, please put your question on a session. There is a question session and we'll take time after each talk to, uh, to exchange and to talk about this, uh, the question that you ask for. Since that not all of the people can join, of course, after today, we will share the replay. Uh, so I will leave the floor to Professor Robadiano and uh, I will uh, wish you a very good session. Hello. Hi. Hello, Hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Hi. Alexandra, for this presentation and uh, to set up this uh, program, which uh, looks uh, very interesting to everyone participating to the to this session because uh, we have different uh, expertise, different point of view for countries, and uh, this means different uh, reference uh, the patients. So we is different population. We have uh, also uh, different approaches to propose to our patient, different technique of repair. And uh, it is uh, for each of us uh, very interesting to share our experience in front of this uh, uh, audience. I would like to thank also the Peter's company who has uh, organized this session and uh, all my colleagues who accepted to be part and to prepare presentation and to share the expertise. Uh, as it has been said before every presentation, we have some question to you. Alexandra, can you send uh, the first uh, door? Alexandra? Yes, absolutely, I will do. So now you can answer to those questions. How do you estimate your repair rate for mitral rheumatism disease? which is a very good question because this is probably, uh, we are probably different kind of rate of answer in different countries. For instance, in France, the patient who are referred to us for rheumatic disease are rather elderly people with a very heavy calcified patient, which is probably uh, not the same situation in the Eastern part of the world where you have rheumatic patient uh, mostly regurgitation rather than uh, stenosis. And the, this probably leads to different uh, answers. So it will be interesting to have the, the answer from the audience. Alexandra, how long do we take to, to get the answer? Uh, just a couple of seconds, I will share with you the result. Uh, here we are. 
Okay, so well, this is very interesting because uh, this means that we have probably in the audience a lot of people uh, connecting from the eastern part of the world. So because we have a high, heavier, important rate of uh, repair, and this is uh, this is interesting. So now we are giving the the, the word to the Dr. Tarizak uh, from Thailand, where you have, you have, and we will probably learn from you because we have much more expertise than what we have in Western Europe. And I am very, very happy to, uh, to hear what you are going to teach us about repairing valves in general and particularly in rheumatic disease. Thank you, Professor Tarizak, for your expertise and for your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Obadia and everyone. Uh, Thank you, Peter. And I think that's a very good question because it's combined the problem globally that we are practicing and facing our problem. I, I, I am responsible for the rheumatic today and I'm trying to share uh, what we are doing here in Thailand and in this part of the world, not because we have the need trying to repair. Actually, we learned from the Western country, from Kapongke, from all of you. So, let, let's see what, what we are going to do, and then we have the question later. Then you can try. It's not moving. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Obadia, Peter, and Summit Healthcare Thailand for this kind of arrangement and invitation for the meeting. I also feel very privileged and honor to attend the meeting along with the uh, world-renowned speaker. Uh, my topic today is to talk in the innovative approach for rheumatic and non-rheumatic mitral valve repair. I have nothing to disclose. I would like to start by the fact that about the surgery of rheumatic mitral valve disease, about the valve repressment, which is good immediately, but anyway, it has some and significant long-term problems. On the other hand, the valve repair is very attractive, but it is difficult to learn, reproduce, and still inherit the problem of reoperation. However, good repair can be achieved when we respect to the basic. And the starting, it has been shown clearly that the repair of the rheumatic mitral valve is good especially in rheumatic mitral insufficiencies by Kabongdea group using Kabongdea techniques in the patients around close to a thousand patients. And with a very low rate hospital mortality, very good survival, and very low rate of tumor and body problem and freedom of reoperation. So it's no doubt that repair of the rheumatic mitral Regurgitation is good. However, there's still some unanswered challenges that's waiting for us to solve and to find a better solution. That is, in cases with predominant mitral stenosis, mixed MSMR, problem that have the balloon and come back with re stenosis and the patient still young and problem of the infective endocarditis in dramatic microbiomes. All of this is still awaiting for the better solution rather than repressment alone. We can search for the better solution by trying to understand the mitral dynamic first. Is dynamic of the mitral valve uh, comprised of several uh, components of the mitral complex. Uh, in order to function, the, the leaflet, the annulus, the leaflet, the cord, the pelvic muscle, and the LV. And in summary, that when the diastole occur, the leaflet will open nicely, flow to the apex, flexes up, the 
the LV started to contract pressure bell up and push the anterior lip that going out, LV out for that open, and then starting to have the good cartation and the anterior and the 18 valve uh, leaflets open and the flow occur. This and can be have can happen with a very good systole cartation to secure the mitral valve apparatus. And the rheumatic valve repair, we have to focus on the target of the commissure called leaflet and the annulus as a holistic approach. And I think that this is a calcifier in SMR cases. Uh, so let, the same principle we have to do the uh, commissiotomy and this ugly calcium slowly, uh, point by point, we can uh, slowly cut it up. And the subval apparatus using the child dissection, like in this case. And uh, the peeling has become the integral part of current uh, valve repair, rheumatic valve repair techniques. And you can see that we can pierce quite a large piece of this thickened and restrictive layer of the of this rheumatic uh, fibrous membrane. Using sharp dissection, we can slowly cut out of this calcification out precisely. And this gradually will improve the mobilization of these leaflet, especially in this case is the anterior leaflet, which is very important in terms of the microbiome function. And using sharp dissection point by point, you can see that we can uh, finally remove all of these uh, pathological calcified layer out and uh, restore back the normal functioning uh, mitral complex. This is the way to do the finestation and the papillotomy in this case. And then you can see that the valve, once we remove all of the pathological lesion, it start to move back the anterior, move up with a very good captation to the posterior lip. Put in the valve ring, sorry that uh, you can see only the part, partly of the video. You can see the valve closing in a very good way. Correct. So the key strategy is to correct both tasseling, step by approach, holistic approach, and do step by commission me, fan shape. MR is usually due to restrictive cord. We have to reset the cord and do the posterior first then anterior. The key strategy is to do finestation more, peeling more, and then use appropriate offering. So decision making that we try to repair more in young patients patient who need pregnancy, poor compliance in the appropriate healthcare system. In recent years, uh, we have developed a uh, uh, surgical technique that can uh, use in the non rheumatic especially the uh, degenerative and bowel disease. And this is uh, what we call folding plasty in the P2 type 2. We just, when we assess the flare part, then we fold it down and make a suture to the annulus as a point of reference. In this way, the frail part is well supported by the annulus and the size of the leaflet that, that we fold down, we support with the center P3, in this case, using the fibrocholine matted suture. In this way, it's very uh, simplified, but still physiologic to repair this P2 type 2 by folding plastic and without uh, any synthetic material and very uh, effective and uh, simplify the procedure by a lot. We put in the ring and then in this case, we can achieve a very good valve repair of P2 type 2 uh, in a very quick and, and, and simplified way. It's very durable. Another uh, technique that we use in the bowel 
valve disease, like in this case, as a flare of the A2, A3. Uh, instead of using the cortex, we just simplify by using the rotating plasty. We rotate this flare part to the annulus. In this way, we and suture is now with the fibrofolding matter suture, like uh, as illustrated here. In this way, we by using rotating plasty, uh, we sim we we just correct the geometry deformity and also the type two using the annulus as a point of reference. And then we, after we use a rotating plasty, we do some commercial plasty at this level. Within the ring, you can see that we can achieve a very good valve competency and good uh, looking valve in a very simplified but still physiologic. And so far, the result is very gratifying. This slide is a drawing to show how we uh, perform the rotating plasty. They are significantly different in size and length of the A1, A2, and A3. But because of this, uh, we can use the rotating plasty by rotate to the annulus and curl it with multiple uh, suture, fibroperlin, and doing some uh, commercial plasty. In this way, we correct both the deformity of the geometry and the functional problem of this valve well, with this uh, movement. And it results in the very uh, good functioning valve uh, according to our uh, follow-up is very, uh, of a very gratifying result. And number this is a number of cases of the romantic up to the 2016, across to, is now 600. The very good result, low mortality rate, durability and uh, low rate of re repair and reoperate. Conclusion, conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and mm -hmm. mitral valve repair, both romantic and non romantic can be effectively accomplished uh, with innovative and simplified approach using the same principle. And we, our aim is to achieve the maximal gradation, which is the key for good long-term result. We are trying to use a minimally or non-resection approach, uh, which is, we feel that uh, effective in preserving tissue for gradation. And Currently, several innovative techniques that are effective to prevent SAM, to provide physiologic photo replacement, and simplify the complex mitral valve repair. I would like to thank you very much for all of your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tawizak. A uh, well, very interesting uh, presentation and uh, all those different aspects of your repair technique. Uh, I saw you you had uh, you use a flexible ring, rigid rings. Is there any recommendation from your part to to use the one instead of the other? Why, why do you choose one? And uh... actually, it, uh, that's a very good point as well because the ring is depend on the to restore and remodel the annulus. So if the ring is very severely deformed, like calcification, severe fibrosis, we would love to have the rigid ring more, yeah. like uh, Capontier, classic, mm -hmm. that is the best because we, we can chair it and then restore everything back. But if not, then we will use at least a uh, complete semi-rigid ring, mm -hmm. complete semi-rigid. For the band, the flexible band, we found this is not very effective in long term because it cannot correct uh, the geometry of the annulus, which is quite distorted in dramatic. At least it should be semi-rigid band. Mm -hmm. okay. That is retain some rigidity. Okay, it so what is that? A difficult question because we have no 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 real answers. It's a question of a of policy in different structure which prefer one or the other. Uh, well, um, 
I have been interested by uh, your expertise of uh, rheumatic uh, repair, and uh, we understand how to assess uh, the regurgitation, but how, how are you sure at the end of the repair that uh, the valve will still be open enough? How do, do, you, do, you, do you evaluate the quality of the opening? So the quality of the competence we know that there is water test, there is different approach with the, yeah. the, 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 where, where is the local, localized the, the free edge, but for the, the quality of the opening in order to, to not, not having a stenosis at the end of surgery. And th there is a risk to, of a patient to come back for stenosis. So how do you prevent that? This is, is actually one of the very important questions because usually when we start the repair, we learn the MR, then we focus on the MR, but the rheumatic, we need to treat the darsalic, the opening, like you said. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand all the, the mitral complex, especially the commissia. Is this a fan chair we need to, to make it move close to the annulus? So we have to do a lot of the fenestration mm -hmm. because the fenestration is one part to allow the leaflet to move transversely. And by itself, it is the alternative root of flow during the DASI, not depend on the central opening. It just go to the finesse channel more. And then we need to do it close to the peplotomy one third so that every single of the lip that when we open is open widely, open nicely. And the commissure close to the annulus, that is the key. So okay. your question is truly very important. And how? What is the mean age of your patients for women? The mean age. The yeah. mean age is it used to be very pretty young, about 25, 30, but mm -hmm. now is it's getting a little bit more, 40 to 50. We found more and more, but in the young, it, I'm not dealing with a very young rheumatic like mm -hmm. under 15, under 10. No. Okay, and uh, we have a question uh, from the audience about the learning curve. How, how many patients did, did you add to, to feel confident with the technique? What, what would you recommend? Yeah, I would say that we choose the type of the repair first. It is a learning curve. We will focus on rheumatic MR first mm -hmm. because that's the way we have the room of the safety margin and once we achieve all of this learning process, the rheumatic pathology, we move toward MSMR. And then the MS that we show you, this is the last step that we fight. So the number, I think that we need to, I don't know exactly the number, but uh, in, in my past, I do almost every two or three cases a week. Okay, okay. I that is about close to 100 cases per year for right. some year. Then it, I learned. It, it, it's the same number for every, every surgical technique, I think. This is also yes. what. Uh, uh, concerning the rotating uh, technique for the repair, I have been a bit surprised even by the concept because uh, when you make this rotation, it means that, uh, let's say, in the presentation you had, the prolapse involved A2 and A3 meaning that yes. almost all the cordae from the posterior papillary muscle were elongated. So as soon as you rotate, the only cordae which will support the anterior leaflet will come from the anterior leaflet, uh, papillary muscle. So you, you have all the free edge, which is maintained by only one papillary muscle, which cross over the midline, uh, does it, uh, is it a problem? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I see. But it's usually- Very anatomical, we, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, what, what we usually do is involve the A2, A3, which involve the papillary muscle on the right side. Yeah. For A1, usually no. Yeah. For A2 and A3. And then we can do that only if it's elongated with some geometry problems. Then we rotate. By rotating, we correct the length of A2, A3 to be normal, and the cord as well. It will move toward, so the perpendicular length will be normalized, and then we support with 
the commission of plastic. If there is some problem, we may use the vortex to, to add on the safety net more, but usually we can rotate most of the time. Okay, okay. And I have noticed in the in one of the, your last slide, you had a, a large proportion of endocarditis. And uh, so you, you also repair endocarditis? Uh, yes, we, we repair quite a lot of endocarditis now. Yeah. If it, even if it's rheumatic or degenerative, well, we can mostly uh, repair more than, now let's say 70 to 80% we can repair. And, and then we use, it's because of the time, I didn't show you the slide that I did show in the WATS recently. Mm -hmm. We can use the peeling approach to minimize the extent of resection. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because the potential, then we can peel it off. Underneath is still good, and then we can use a rotating and folding prostate to do that. So most of the infective endocarditis now we can repair more and more. Okay, I see. We have uh, uh, and uh, about pericardium. Do you use pericardium? Which kind is uh, autologous? Do you use? Uh, how do you fix it? We have question from the audience. Yeah, I use autologous most of the time, and I do fix it with putalaudi high. Only when it is not too big, then I use a fresh autologous pericardium. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, the question about uh, the wing, do you use wing even young patients, in young patients? Yes. If it's more than 24, 26, usually we are very happy. And uh, probably you, you use open uh, ring if you have young patient in order to allow some uh, growing. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. So anyhow, I think uh, it's in time. Thank you, Professor Tawis. Thank like, you. It's very interesting to have uh, this discussion with you and uh, this uh, ex exceptional expertise about rheumatic uh, disease. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing. Now thank we you have very much. to Dr. Vijit from uh, Sherian in India and other country and, uh, and other expertise. Uh, Dr. Vijit, we are very happy to have your expertise and uh, thank you for your presentation. We are, well, yes, we have first this uh, quick poll. Can you answer to the question? Uh, uh, tomorrow, after this webinar, you will have a mitral rheumatic case. And will you, uh, you we have the, uh, try to answer to the question. Did you change your mind? Okay, I think we are, can have the answer. Maybe Alexandra, can you give uh, the answers? Okay, I will try to repair. I'm expecting more tweaks. Of course, of course, we, we have to, to need more. So, Professor Tawizak, we have to come back. Thank you for, for your <laughs> Thank you very much. We, we need more, not surprisingly. It's a, it's a difficult task. Well, so now, uh, Dr. Vijit, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, give uh, your presentation right now. Thank you, Dr. Vijit. Um, Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Bhatia and uh, my respected speakers. And thank you, Peters, for this opportunity to be part of this webinar. So I'm going to talk about mitral valvular pathologies and mitral valve repair techniques uh, and Indian perspective. So India has one of the highest numbers of mitral valve disease in the world, as you know, and uh, rheumatic uh, disease has reduced in incidence. However, it continues to be a difficult problem for cardiac surgeons in India. So the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease is now somewhere in the 0.59 per thousand population, and it was much higher about four decades back. So if you look at this uh, you know, study from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, looking up to 2014, you'll notice that the endemic areas are largely in the Asian and African regions and, and some of South America and some of the uh, Polynesian islands. 
And the high incidence of rheumatic heart disease continues in, in our Indian subcontinent and some parts of uh, Central Africa. It's more than 200 per 100,000, which is quite a large number. So it continues to be a, a major problem. And in spite of all the treatment, prophylaxis, and early detection, even today, it accounts for about around 100,000 deaths worldwide. So coming to India, we have, uh, uh, as cardiac surgeons, um, across India, we do about 225,000 open hearts uh, across India. And of this, uh, we estimate, and we don't have actual uh, registries, but we estimate that the repairs are somewhere around 6,500. And the mitral valvular pathology in India is around 40 to 50% are rheumatic mitral valve disease. Uh, ischemic mitral valve is about 20% and the balance 25 to 30% are myxomatous. Uh, we find Barlow's disease to be rare uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Now, how does the Indian disease uh, differ in, in rheumatic heart disease? So this was Studied in 1983, there was a paper from the Archives of Internal Medicine where uh, our um, Professor Gopinath and some pathologists did a comparative study. And they found that the calcification and the fibrosis was much more intense. And you had a population which was much younger as compared to the American group. So we found the second and third decade there was a, a much more prevalence of mitral valve disease. And if you look at the type of mitral stenosis, there were more, more calcification and uh, the dominant mitral regurgitations were also more in India as compared to the American group. So this, this is the only uh, uh, study that I could find, which was uh, a little different. Now, this is a mitral uh, stenosis, um, you know, the typical echo that you would find in India. Normally, they would have undergone some procedure, a BMV or sometimes a closed mitral valvotomy. And it's quite typical to see these very fibrotic, rigid valves. So this is a lady who's 40 years old, had a previous uh, balloon mitral valvotomy and comes to you with rather high gradients. So these our experience in uh, India has, has been summarized in a couple of papers from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. This is uh, in 2001 and uh, another one in, in 2006 where we had about 900 patients and uh, these were repaired quite aggressively at, at that point of time. And you will notice that though the mortality is low, there is a lot of residual mitral regurgitation. So at the end of 10 years, you would see moderate MR in about 20% and severe MR in about 15%. And to look at the techniques that were followed, which is largely what the rest of the country does, uh, you, you do need annuloplasty in about 90% of cases. So except for those very fibrotic annulus, so most of them require an annuloplasty Commissurotomies are, are very much uh, important part of the repair. And the cuspal thinning or the peeling procedure is something which is very integral to rheumatic repairs. And you will see other procedures like decalcification, caudal shortening, all, all uh, part of this repair. And one surprising thing you will find is that the neocordate construction is relatively low. So a 10-year follow-up of the rheumatic mitral valve repair in, in, our, uh, uh, in the Indian context, you will find that the reoperation rate is somewhere in the, eight, um, the freedom from reoperation is about 81%, but uh, the mitral regurgitation continues to be a significant problem. 
So the rheumatic valve appearance that we see in our country is typically like this. The, the picture on the left, you have very thickened fibrotic uh, valve leaflets uh, going down into the subvalvar apparatus. And after peeling the anti-rheumatal leaflet, you, you can possibly get a more pliable valve. Now, this is a, a paper which has influenced a lot of us as surgeons, the anterior mitral leaflet length. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sampat Kumar, who had an extensive experience. Uh, he found that this was a predictor for mitral valve repair in a rheumatic population. So this, this uh, is something which is very useful because you start out uh, with repair, you need to know which uh, mitral valves are actually, uh, the rheumatic mitrals are actually repairable. And what he found was that an intraoperative AML length of about 26 millimeters or more uh, predicts a high uh, chance of you repairing the valve. And he indexed this and uh, found that 18 millimeters per meter square was one of the uh, findings where he found that you could go ahead with repairing these valves. So I just uh, will share this video where we, we look at the mitral valve. We, this is a typical um, you know, rheumatic regurgitation, mixed pathology, um, rheumatic valve that we would see. It's a, quite a thickened valve, quite restricted mobility. And you can see that the whole AML is quite thickened. So we start out with using a pair of forceps closer to the anterior annulus. Uh, try and find a plane there. It's not always easy to find that. So it's a combination of using uh, your forceps with some sharp uh, dissection. So you have to take care that you don't you know, make the leaflet too thin and uh, perforate the valve because that then changes a lot of the dynamics. And uh, you may use a 15 blade and then continue to peel off the anterior mitral leaflet. So you are able to get, in many cases, a good layer, which is quite thick, which comes and can be held well with your, with your forceps and come all the way to the junction of the smooth and the rough zone. So once you come to that junction, uh, you have to again take care that you do not excise any of the major cordae. And uh, here we again dissect sharp and remove that uh, the thickened peel of the AML. So this is something which takes a lot of, um, you know, it takes a learning curve. Uh, you need to chase it and try to th thin out as much of the AML as is possible. Here you'll see that you actually get a very good pliable anterior leaflet. And in many cases, very little else needs to be done. And this can be completed with usually a semi-rigid anuloplasty rib. So I'd like to share uh, an echo of, of a a gentleman who was 26 years old when, when I operated on him. It was a calcific mixed mitral pathology. He had a calcification in the posterior commissure and uh, we followed him up uh, recently at around seven years. And uh, you will see that these valves do quite well. Um, there is some thickening of the subvalvar apparatus, but it's quite a good pliable valve and uh, he's off any medication and his gradients are quite reasonable. Now, these are some of the, um, journal, the, the journals that gave some of the experiences of the surgeon in the Indian context. So we had Dr. Sampat Kumar talking about his experience in children and in the rheumatic heart disease, these are references uh, just for your uh, uh, reference. And uh, coming to 
minimally invasive for cardiac surgery for MP repair. It's, a, it's something which has been adopted by very few centers. And uh, it's largely because 75% of our pathology is not suitable for the mix approach. And uh, there is the access to equipment and training, which also are some of the reasons why mitral valve repair in MICS is not so well, well adopted in India. Um, however, the mitral valve replacements, aortic valve replacements, and CABGs are commonly done um, in, with the MICS technique. So some of the constraints that uh, we as Indian surgeons find uh, doing mitral valve repair here is number one is the financial constraints of the patients. It's usually a single procedure in uh, almost 80% uh, of the population. There is the limitations of rheumatic pathology. And uh, I mean, we feel in our experience that not more than 70% are suitable for repair. The valvular pathologies gravitate to certain public hospitals, mission hospitals who, who have their own constraints. Uh, to support a mitral valve program. And uh, fear of failure in the surgeon is, is something quite real. So there is, uh, you know, the, especially rheumatic patients coming back is always a concern. And there is limited access to certain MICs equipment. Even loop sutures are not uh, very commonly available because of the cost. And cardiology and cardiac anesthesia support for TE and referrals are most important. So the way forward is we have now, in the last two, three years, we formed a group of cardiac surgeons who have taken this initiative to have annual mitral valve repair, live surgical programs to encourage our uh, junior colleagues to, to come and share the mitral valve repair uh, approaches and techniques. And uh, we have the industry um, helping us to train surgeons and we are also looking at ways of focusing on more mitral valve disease being triage for mitral valve repair. Thank you very much. And I hope I, hope I have uh, done some um, justice to the Indian aspect. Thank you, Dr. Vijita. Very, very, very interesting uh, presentation with, uh, is, uh, which complete very well the previous one. And uh, I have been very interested by uh, different aspects. First of all, you had um, numbers at the beginning of your presentation based on uh, rather ancient papers. And uh, I would like to ask you if you have a registry in India today, how do you, do you have a real evaluation of what you are doing? And for instance, uh, repair in rheumatic disease had the poor reputation. And uh, I am asking, uh, what has really changed from, let's say, 20 years uh, ago, and uh, what uh, let you uh, be confident today, more confident in those repair techniques than what we should be before? Because we, we were reluctant to, to repair, on, at least on a large proportion of patients, but uh, what, what has changed today, what has registry, and what is new? So we, we have a, a Indian association registry, which, which does keep uh, abreast with a lot of the uh, basic patient data. They may not be exhaustive, but it's there. But what has changed is that uh, I think the fear of a reoperation um, has changed in the last 20 years. So we are more confident to go in again. Uh, I found that, you know, a couple of decades back, that seemed to be a very a major problem to, to go in and do a reoperation. So reoperations have become uh, quite safe uh, in our setting, and uh, there is more, um, you know, the, there is more encouragement and more the approach to helping young patients uh, is is to try try and repair because we we've seen the complications of mechanical mitral valve, uh, you know, in young patients. It's quite quite discouraging. Excuse me, okay, this, this part of your answer, um, you are more confident in the technique because in case of uh, the, the calcification or recurrence of the disease, you are more confident to reoperate the patient. But my question yeah. is, do you improve the quality of the first technique 
this is the point. And uh, what are the new techniques today in order to, to wait a longer time before you have to reoperate the patient? Has anything changed from, let's say, during the, the previous year? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the, the, you know, the timing of mitral valve surgery is something we've, we've learned, you know, to, to push the mitral valve, uh, the timing of the surgery, to, to get that repair at the optimum time and to plan, uh, you know, to push the surgery to somewhere in the, sec in the third or fourth decades. And uh, this, this has, uh, you know, helped us in getting uh, more patients into the mitral valve repair group. Uh, but, you know, it continues to be a, a difficult problem. So you, you go through um, half of the surgery and sometimes you find that the rheumatic repairs don't look that uh, promising as, as you would like it to. So, so, so we, we've improved in using more neocode. Uh, we have used, you know, like Dr. Tarisak has done in freeing the leaflets, in, in, in getting up all that tethering, um, get, getting a more freely opening valve. These are things which have improved our approach in the, in the last, uh, I would say, 10 to 15 years. And, and so, do, you, do you operate the patient earlier now in order to avoid a time when there are too many calcification and in order to have a, a hope to, to have a longer follow-up? Is, is this a, a recommendation on your side to operate the patient earlier and your to, to operate and then your phase of their disease when yeah. they have uh... we, we, we would we would probably wait you know wait for the uh, the disease to mature and mm -hmm. and then then uh, look at it a little later so um, our, our experience has been uh, to to push a mitral valve repair to the maximum you know and 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 Try and repair as many as possible before before actually replacing. So okay. these, these these take a little longer. I'm I'm, I'm I have to confess that you know, these procedures are much longer than the usual operations. Okay, in your presentation, the video on the peeling was very yes. very nice and very for an, on an educational standpoint. I think it was very informative for for the people who were looking at the, the this video. Can you help us in uh, um, how do you choose uh, the right cleavage plan? Because there is also a risk of perforation if you go yes. too far. How, how you, do you choose the, the right uh, the place to do the, the job? Yeah, I think uh, somewhere about five millimeters from the anterior annulus, you know, the, the distance from the annulus, you start from there. Those, that happens to be one of the more uh, less thickened areas, so that that gives you a, a good good cleavage. Uh, it it is difficult. You can perforate, but I think it, it, this this has to be done extremely slowly with a lot of patience, um, and uh, you need both the combination of uh, sharp dissection and and using the forceps. So um, I I feel it it takes time. It's again a learning curve. Uh, but the, the anterior annulus, that, that area is, is where you have to start. That is, that is the plane that you should get and, and no other place. Yes, it was, it was, when we saw the movie, it, it was very convincing, but we saw also that it, it requires experience because it, it is probably not easy to know how deep you have to, to cut inside the, the thick. Yes. Uh, yeah. of, the, of the leaflet. And this is uh, probably, uh, well, for instance, in our country, we almost never see those patients because uh, you have young patients. We had another question for the audience about the, the replacement. When, when you don't repair and when you reoperate the patient, you have to change the valve. And do you have any specific technique uh, in order to preserve for subvalvular apparatus? Are there any, any question, any, any recommendation on the, on the, on the this uh, for replacement? Yes, I think uh, once you uh, are not confident of a durable repair, uh, then, then you preserve the cordae and, and, and uh, we would use the mechanical valve. These, these are usually mechanical valve patients, unless they are childbearing uh, ladies, where then we will use the bioprosthetic valve. Um, so so it, it, we, do, we do come, uh, I think in my experience, it's somewhere 
in in the you know 10 15 percent you 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 fail uh, in spite of all your planning mm -hmm. and uh, it, you still can't fail and we have also a question of, about pulmonary hypertension is there a limit for repair you yeah, make about a patient who have pulmonary hypertension does it uh, imply your technique? Do you repair or replace uh, if a patient has a severe pulmonary hypertension due to stenosis or uh, huge mitral no. No. no, no, I, I, I don't think that that changes your decision because yes. it, I, I feel that it all settles down in, in most cases. Your choice of repair depends mainly on the anatomy of the valve. That's on it. the anatomy, that's right. Okay. Uh, and uh, for calcified valve, uh, more, uh, if you have calcification on the leaflet, it's a qu another question of the audience. Do you avoid this peeling technique or even in the presence of calcification, you can peel the leaflets? I think uh, what I usually do is to uh, take a rounder and remove the calcium first and, and then uh, get on to the peeling. So there are cases where, you know, there is some superficial calcification where you're able to remove most of the calcium and then the next step would be the peel. Okay, okay, last question now. Uh, the peeling is obviously mainly due onto the anterior leaflet. Do you also peel the posterior leaflet, which is all very often more calcified with, uh, what is your- Yes. Yes, I, I, I didn't touch on that because I, I find it quite disappointing. I have tried uh, peeling the PML and, yeah. and it really doesn't contribute uh, much to the rheumatic repair. I've done leaflet extensions. No, I, I still feel the AML length is, is the decider. So I would not waste so much of time with, with the PML peeling. This is my experience. Maybe we can have the, the advice of... Uh... Uh, Dr. Tawisak, because you also have yeah. the expertise. Dr. Tawisak, can you make a comment from your... Yes, I, I think the comment uh, is good, but uh, the first, firstly, uh, I think we peel almost every case, and it can be done. Although it looks thick, but uh, to peel it, it will, it will facilitate the hinge point, which yeah. is very important. Yeah. One of what we found one of the problem of diastolic is because the posterior get caught by obstruction. So if we can peel and the hinge open, it's just like a waterfall, the diastolic flow will become much, much improved. So we peel it and surprisingly we can peel it. We can peel it, although it, it, it is a small, the length is a little bit smaller compared to the anterior, but you can use the same principle to peel it. And then I would suggest it because when we start to peel, we use less and less pericardium to augment the, peri the leaflet, which is good in the young because problem of calcification in the long term will be much reduced because it's a natural tissue. So, and the other thing that we found that to, to peel, you need to use just like a ping pong, you know, you mentioned about the plan, the plan, you cannot, have two people, you use your surgeon. You, yes. you feel it's give, it's give, it's give, it's give. And if you perforate, so what? Make a small suture. Okay. It's okay, it should be fine. By using the one ping pong technique, mm -hmm. you can start and then slowly go down to the rough zone for sure. And by slowly move enter and post there and then close the commissure, then slowly cut it up. And surprisingly, if you try, you will find not too, not that difficult. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tawisak, for this encouragement. Yeah, thank you to both yeah. of you, because this is, uh, we, uh, I have been very interested because I have absolutely, almost, almost no experience of such patients we never see anymore in our country today. And uh, it was very informative in the, even for us. And uh, now we have to move to another kind of patient and uh, on minimally invasive approach, what we are mostly doing in the uh, Western part of Europe. And uh, the first speaker will be my, my colleague, uh, the Dr. Gal Daniel Greenberg in France, who works in, uh, in my, uh, in, uh, in my uh, service. 
And uh, we are discussing one specific aspect of uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, which concerns the cannulation, because we, the cannulation is a source of uh, complication and we have to pay attention to the cannulation signs and the high quality we have to, to get for, for this uh, first aspect of the, of the surgery. And uh, it is very important to be very, very uh, precise on this point. Do we have question, Alexandra, for this uh, before this? Yes, a quick poll. Uh, what are your initial thoughts regarding minimal invasive surgery? This is a question to, to the audience. Okay, I think uh, maybe Alexandra, we can have uh, the back, uh, the feedback from the, the audience. Okay. Okay, good, good. So, so there are already uh, people interested in, the, in, this, uh, in this. So, okay, so it will be interesting to share our experience with you. Uh, Daniel, you can, uh, you can start now. Thanks, and I think the theme is that you have the full screen. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for uh, having me uh, today for, the, for this discussion. I will, I will talk mainly about uh, minimal invasive surgery uh, and basically giving some basics, tricks, and tips for uh, starting uh, for starting this uh, this kind of procedure. For and and I will focus on some uh, techniques for uh, repair in uh, degenerative disease. I'm Daniel Greenberg. I'm uh, an attending in the Department of uh, Cardiovascular, Cardiovascular Surgery here in Lyon, France, in the Department of, uh, of Professor Obadia. So. We've been pretty lucky. I've been pretty lucky here to do my my training here because um, the, the the hospital, this center, this uh, this service has been following all the um, all the, the 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 technique development and the device development here. And we've been seeing uh, programs like the magical program, like the NoCord program, Tenine program. And we've also been involved in the treatment of the, uh, uh, in the adoption of the, of the minimal invasive mitral valve surgery technique throughout your, the years, but at the very beginning of the technique. We're performing now more than 100 cases a year uh, with a total experience of more than 1,500 patients. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go through the comparison between the, 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 the median sternotomy and, and the thoracotomy. There's many, many. Uh, studies, uh, retrospective studies that have been done for that, and I think it's not the topic today, but we, we already know uh, uh, what, uh, what are the pros and cons of both techniques. Um, I'm going to talk first about the setup because, because as we all know, the setup and the, and the view is, uh, is very, very important to, for, for doing good, good repair. So this is our uh, basic setup. Um, there's basically uh, two, two golden rules that, that we try to apply for, for every case. The first one is that we are trying to have the standard setup for all the patient and a setup that's for anesthesiology that is it's gonna be very close to the median sternotomy. In our centers, there's a lot of anesthesiologists and, and we know that if you ask them to put um, uh, uh, um, selective uh, on the tracheal tube. This gets caused issue, loss of time and everything. So in our center, we decided to have a very standardized setup with just a central line, single lumen on the, on the tracheal tube and a TEE probe, obviously. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, single lumen on the tracheal tube policy is also due because we always, always start the surgery with two operators. And one's going to do the, 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 the pericutal escalation, the other one's going to do the opening. And by the time that the opening is going to be down, condition will be uh, in place, and then we'll be able to start to see the, the, the bypass and, and, and deflate the lens. The second goal rule, uh, golden rule is that we have to have the best exposure on all the right chests, and, uh, and we are uh, going to put the arm as la like that in order to have the best exposure of the, of the right chest and obviously having the sternum still in the operative field for the surgery. Uh, there's a very good trick for having a good exposure of the right chest is 
using the, the adhesive drapes like that, we're gonna be able to push the whole, um, the whole breast on the left side. And with, with this trick, you, we are able to push the, the nipple on the left and having a, an opening that's gonna be here. So back, back in the surgery, we're gonna open here, um, but the skin uh, is actually open here and it gives very nice scar and very good aesthetic outcomes, as you can see here on the young female. And in male, we can do a periareolar opening that gave us a very nice, uh, very nice scar and very, very nice aesthetic uh, result. Let's talk now about peripheral correlation because, because this is also a very, uh, a very important point for the technique. Um, so uh, we we have had the experience of the peripheral correlation and the and the pre-closing uh, techniques for the arteries uh, for many years now. So we, we used to start with the, with the arterial correlation, usually on, on the left groin. Um, I know it's often a question, there's many centers who are doing pre-op CT scan for all the patients. It's not our policy here, and we're doing basically clinical exam. And in some patients with, a, with high uh, risk of, uh, of arteriopathy, we're gonna do CT scan, but it's not systematic. What is actually systematic and very important is the puncture under uh, Doppler US uh, control, uh, ultrasound control. There's there's no puncture without without the the, the Doppler probe, and the, the all the cannulation will be done under TEE control. And there's no way to push a cannula without having a perfect location of the tip of the guide wire uh, for that. We're we're using a true proglide pre closing system. Back in the time we were using a ProStar, which also gave us good results, but but there's there are uh, uh, there are now studies that that show that proglitis might be a little bit better, and we are using for almost all our, all our patients a, a, a seven, 17 French uh, percutaneous cannula. For the venous cannula, this is also a very uh, important point. We're doing the usually on the right side. There's less uh, risk of uh, of uh, of uh, Lyme ischemia and. And, and this is this is so this is our setup. Obviously, puncture under Doppler to scan TE control. The the I think that one of the most important thing for the surgery for this technique actually is to be sure that you have a good venous drainage, which includes the drainage of the superior vena cava, and this could be done using uh, two stages uh, cannulas that like we are using a soaring one, but whatever. So, and but otherwise the use of a thermal uh, uh, two cannulas one thermal one in a jugular a jugular vein is uh, is a very good option because you can't do a good surgery if you don't have a, a drainage of the supervena cava so uh, so this is a very important point um, this is some literature about the use of a of the proglides for uh, minimally invasive much of surgery. So we are using, using this technique. One, one prolide we will be facing 10, uh, 10 hours, the other one two hours. It's very straightforward for big cannula being puncture. And you can see here in this, in this review, uh, very, very good result in terms of, uh, of uh, lymphatic, of, of a complication with a very, very small rate of, uh, of vascular issue actually. My next point will be about the valve exposure. This is our, our standard setup. We are uh, doing the surgical incision in the, in the fourth intercostal space. So very often this is, this is a, a concern for surgeons who are starting. Uh, I think the best, the best advice for, for, for finding the right opening is basically to be in the middle of the chest. So this is actually what we're doing. And another uh, uh, trick is, to um, uh, to if you're not sure about the about the level of the opening, uh, open at the upper level if you have a doubt between two of them. We are using a soft tissue retractor as you can see here, and very often we try to avoid using rigid retractors that are usually uh, um, cause more pain in, in post operative care. Uh, we're using um, uh, uh, this kind of thoracoscope. It is a rigid one, obviously, 
uh, 10 French um, and uh, with a 30 degrees uh, uh, angle. And you can see here that we are not using trocars. This is uh, uh, this is the, our way to do. Some surgeons are using trocars and smaller toracoscope, uh, but uh, this is some something that we've done from very long time, and that's that our our go-to technique. In terms of clamping of of uh, RT clamp, there's there have been several several discussion um, paper. Um, between the 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 the, the, the transartic clamp and the and the the, uh, the end clamp. So in our in our center, we always use sheet wood clamp uh, with and we are we have to say that gave us very good result and we didn't have any case of RT dissection with uh, with this technique. We're using uh, the actual retractor developed by Professor Badia here. And finally, uh, none of the incision are lost, and we are using the two incision for the trochoscope and the cheat wood clamp for uh, uh, for the drainage afterwards. Uh, this is this is a video of, of our setting um, and the view. I think this can convince you uh, that 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 the, the the view, the actual point of view with uh, with this technique is very good one. So you can see here all the pericardium. You recognize here the superior of the vena cava with the cannula that is pushed a little bit too too far in this in this video in the superior vena cava that it, it can be pushed uh, and and set up at the at the right level of the patient. You can see all the nerves here. The pericardium will be open pretty high at the junction between the right. Uh, the, the, the right atrium and the aorta to avoid any injury of the aorta. Um, as I just said, the pericardium is open pretty high and we are gonna first go further up to have a nice view on the aorta. There's some uh, uh, pericardial suspension. I'm sorry because the slides are, are, are in French, um, but it's pretty easily understandable. So two pericardial suspension and this gave an a tremendous uh, a view on the aorta and the and the right cavities. We're going to start first with uh, the first ring for um, the cardioplegia catheter. The the cardioplegia will be actually the only arterial opening for all the surgery. Um, and the, which which explain why there's very few uh, uh, bleeding complications in such technique. Then the 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 left the, the groove will be the interarterial groove will be open pretty nicely as you can see here. This is the left atrial vent. And then the, the atrial retractor will be put in place and will give us a tremendous view on the mitral valve. And I should admit that here the view is fantastic. And I, I think that we can say uh, pretty confidently that, that we managed to have this kind of view for almost all our patients. Uh, moving, moving after, moving to uh, the, the the classical repairs. There's also, as we you you all know, a large debate about the best technique. I think that what's the most important thing to say about what the, the what are the best technique is that we have to use multi-target anatomical target uh, repair, either with the leaflet, the survival apparatus, and and uh, and with the the mitral analyzers this uh, endless discussion about what's the best technique between respect and respect. Uh, in our institution, the, um, I think that we could say that our policy is more this one. We try to respect uh, as, uh, as much as we, we can and keep the resection for, uh, for uh, some, some cases, but they are actually pretty rare. I would just like to, there, there have been many, many techniques uh, display for uh, for uh, res respect techniques. I would like just to 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 focus on on this technique, the the, the classic 
uh, um, loop technique that, had, that was described already 20 years ago by the team of Leipzig about, about, about the loop. So in this technique, there's, there's four steps. The first one is to measure length of the normal chordae. Some centers are also proposing to use a systematic uh, chordae of 15 millimeters for the posterior valve, 25 for the anterior valve. Uh, afterwards, you can either create the loop yourself uh, using these techniques, but also you can also use some pre-made uh, pre loops. Then you're going to place the loop on the papillary muscle on the tip of the papillary mus muscle, and then attach the loop to the free edges of this valve. These techniques has been has been studied, and you have this uh, beautiful uh, report that would, that was published recently. And uh, and the 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 Leipzig Center has been adopted this technique in almost all the patients throughout the years. You can see here that now they're using this technique in 97% of their patient in almost all configuration of patient, all diseases with really, really amazing uh, uh, long-term outcome for, for the technique, both in terms of uh, mortality, but also repair rate. Finally, we're using an, an annuloplasty obviously in every patient in our center, we're using flexible band for all our patient and usually removing the anterior part of it. And to attach the, the band, we're gonna use uh, cardioxile uh, 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 sutures that are that give us the uh, the best result for both our replacement and our repair technique. Um, this that was that's what this is the end of, of, of the of the presentation. Uh, we are here having many surgeons all, all, all around the world. We hope that the pandemic will end soon, and we'll be very happy to have you here in our center if you if you want to visit us and to see uh, some cases with us. Well, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Daniel, and uh, it, I was very happy to to have uh, Daniel to share our experience. And uh, I know that uh, Thorsten, my, my, our friend Thorsten, has a huge experience of the loop technique, and uh, his presentation will complete very well what uh, Daniel has just said. And maybe it would be more convenient to group the two presentations and have the discussion all together after your presentation, Thorsten. Uh, you, you were in Leipzig, I remember, and you, you, yes. you participated to this uh, loop expertise and you, you, we produce it all, all uh, together in your center now. So thank you for your presentation uh, right now and then we will dig discuss together. I am very happy to, to hear what you, what you will say. Okay, yeah. Jean-Francois, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Peter Surgical for organizing this and inviting me and i'm very pleased to be uh, part of this fantastic group and uh, i've been impressed uh, by tabuisak's uh, presentations uh, already in the past and uh, now from dr vidget this was a fantastic uh, experience for me as well and you know based on these uh, uh, presentations from from you actually i've uh, started repairing uh, the odd mitral valve stenosis here as well and uh, uh, we use the peeling and it's really a fantastic technique and uh, I've had some tremendous successes. Only problem here is that patients are usually much older when they come and uh, so oftentimes uh, the replacement is the reasonable option at the time. So, but anyway, so with that, I think I get started and uh, Danielle just very made a very nice introduction into the minimally invasive approaches and there's not much I have to add in terms of, or I can add, but um, Let's go to um, these things. If you want to access the valve from the, from the side, look at, you know, I, I would like to, let's put it this way. I would like you to uh, take sort of a principle approach, you know, understand principles of this access, principles of mitral valve surgery. And, and this is the key. And I think um, if there's one thing that, that you should take home is that there are many ways to the heart. And number two is there is a certain impact of an annuloplasty, and I will come to that later, um, that addresses a lot of these things that have been presented today and that, will may, that may make sense all of a sudden why all these different techniques work. But you will, you'll get to this, we'll get to this in a second. So if you look at the base of the heart where the valves are, then you can imagine that from coming from the right side, there must be access to it. And whether you one rib higher or one rib lower, at one point you see P3 better, at one point you, you see P1 better, but there are always tricks and ways to, uh, to address this once you're inside. 
So what we do is we don't do regular CTs for mitrals or tricuspid, but we do regular CTs if we have the aortic valve involved. And then if we address the aortic plus the mitral and the aortic plus mitral and tricuspid. So we do all different valve types, all, everything you want. Basically, we have a different approach coming from the right, but we leave the sternum usually intact. So those are ways, for instance, we have a parasternal aortic valve replacement. This is a minimally invasive, an older picture, but the minimally invasive uh, approach here uh, in a man. And this is, has been a multiple valve. We did a mitral valve repair and an aortic valve replacement in this guy. And then uh, in those cases, we always use um, the uh, um, CTs before. So here you see a classic P2 prolapse, okay? Here you see the repair. But this is one of the principles where you under, have to understand what these uh, loops can do. You have this prolapse here. It's a pretty, you know, decent size, not large, but it's an individualized. It's a, um, but the problem is look at this. Look at P1 and P2. And P2 is much larger and longer than P1 and P3. So, you know, Daniela, what you just said in terms of measuring the cord length based on the natural cords. So what are the natural cords? And how do you account for the differences in length of the disease leaflet part? So the problem is we always want the, anterior, the posterior leaflet to be flat in the back and the anterior leaflet to coapt against it. So the repair technique and the loop length has to be adapted to the, um, to the annuloplasty ring that you eventually, or your annuloplasty strategy that you use. And we've actually, and it's very helpful to know the dimensions of those rings. And we've written a paper that we call the voodoo paper. Uh, you can find it, it's together with uh, Craig Miller. And um, so in this case, now you have these loops and then we, uh, I'll fast forward this. Uh, we bring this in and then um, we can test this. And you see the result here. And you see that there is a little bit of movement in the posterior leaflet, but not much. And usually there is no movement. And especially if you resect, there is no movement of the posterior leaflet anymore. And uh, so let me see. I wanna show you one thing, water test. You know, if you do the water test here, you may see that it's leaky, but then you pull and then there was, uh, wait, hold on. If there is, okay, here there's leak. You know, you would think, oh, there's prolapse anterior leaflet. But if you pull on the ring, there's no prolapse of the anterior leaflet anymore. And there's no problem here. And look where the, look where the anterior leaflet actually coapts against the posterior leaflet. Look at the assessment here. So what you see on the water test is not what you see later on on the echo because your annuloplasty pulls down your entire uh, coaptation part into the ventricle. And that is a principle that one can apply and you will see that later we've done that. And so it's important to realize that your water test is not necessarily the truth that you see what you have once the heart is actually beating. And what we do is we plan based on the echo here. We have a repair concept. We say we use loops and we use a ring that we size like classic Carpentier sizing. And then we uh, take the result as it is. If we're happy with the way we did the repair, then we're happy with the result. And usually that helps and our water test really doesn't, doesn't care much. So respect, resect, Daniela has shown it. I can go through this. The neocords tend to have better ejection fraction, fewer redos, and you can use larger annuloplasty rings maybe, but those are just facts. And you've seen the Leipzig experience. I've indeed contributed significant numbers here to these patient populations. And I'm a big fan of using the loops. We also use groin access and you've seen already here uh, our paper. And uh, the, the good thing that you've not seen is uh, that Danielle didn't mention, you actually save operating time. You know, we could send home patients a little bit earlier, but uh, that's because we have less groin complications. But the operating time here is really an, a key issue. And it takes us about five minutes now to do this. And oftentimes I have to wait for the ACT, the heparin to work, because we give that after we have punctured both vessels and then uh, until I can start the pump. So um, we've reviewed the evidence because if you do this and if you um, want to uh, take a route that is more complex and technically more challenging, then you have to know that you're not causing any harm and it has to go the same. And we've reviewed this and found no difference, but 
uh, Joe Lamelas, who uh, also is very much experienced, of course, he's probably the one having the greatest experience with all these multiple valves in, in, in worldwide. I mean, uh, he's a good friend and we've done this manuscript together. And we realized that uh, actually minimally invasive surgery can expand the spectrum. So I wanna give you a few uh, uh, um, patients, uh, uh, ideas here. This is a patient here on the right, you can see him after the surgery. He had um, double mammary placed before and we've just opened here the car and the right mammary was going underneath the sternum. So no one dared to open, re redo the surgery and he had severe mitral uh, um, and tricuspid problems. And so we replaced this valve. The, what I do is I do it on the beating heart and I put the sucker right into the ventricle in order to expel air towards the atrium so that there's no air expelled into the aorta. And then we can do, we have all the time of the world to place the sutures for the replacement or you can do repairs as well, no problem and then uh, cool the patient a little bit. And we cool him because once we take, we place all the sutures here, um, we start fibrillating the heart. And then we fibrillate, bring down the valve. And um, then we tie it. So we bring it down, then we tie it. And then once you're done, um, that's a, a little bit of de-airing. So no air is being ejected and then you have a regular replacement. So that's one way that you can do. You can do concomitant tricuspid valve repairs here in this guy with the, uh, with the uh, um, uh, pacemaker wire was actually causing a problem in addition. And um, in these patients here, you can, uh, next one here. If we just put a band and leave the thing where it is, sometimes we relocate it or we fix it here on the band. Um, you can actually achieve um, um, a very good result here. And uh, the annuloplasty usually takes care of the leaks that uh, are caused from the, um, from, the, uh, core, from the pacemaker wires. So on the beating heart, redo tricuspids, isolated, very nice technique coming from the side. Um, same approach as Daniela has shown. And this is a guy who had a tricuspid valve repair through sternotomy before you can see the sutures. This is actually a lady. Um, she traveled 500 kilometers in order to get the surgery because no one wanted to operate on her. We replaced uh, the valve. In this case, she, she wanted a, a, a bovine valve and um, her atrium was one liter in size. She had been with this free that's complete after endocarditis and the failed repair. It was a complete torrential TR. And then um, that's the final, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, or hold on, hold on. sorry. No, wait a minute. Then uh, the final result here is, is very nice. And then the good thing about this procedure, if you don't dissect the pericardium, you can just use it in order to close this. And this is a very nice procedure. We've done very many cases of those, almost a hundred. And we've never had a bleeding from this side. We've had a bleeding from the thoracotomy or anything like that but it was never from this side. So this is, you know, the, one of the problems through stenotomy, if you dissect this, that's a problem. Okay, so, and this is our experience here. We've published this and we've shown that the minimally invasive redos is better than the reduced stenotomy. So we can actually improve outcomes with this minimally invasive technique. And here, this is a case with the mitral uh, and, and aortic endocarditis, where we have this mitral and that we resected that and then uh, we uh, actually opened the aorta here. You can see this, uh, and then we, we could take the vegetation off, just inspect it with the um, scope. And we do this by direct vision. And so the scopes are sort of helpful and uh, to be able to show, show these videos here. And um, so once uh, we've closed the aorta, otherwise we'd have the valve replaced there. Then in this case, we resuspend the papillary muscle. Um, and then uh, we also closed the left atrial appendage. Uh, we did a cryoablation in this case, eventually implanted the valve here, uh, hook up the papillary muscle, then close it, close the atrium, and then we go on the beating heart on the to the tricuspid valve. So that's uh, another way of, of doing it. And then eventually, you know, you have this result and it looks very nice and uh, have, so we just published our results here as well. It just came out last year. And uh, our first experience here, there's only a few numbers. We've done about 30 cases with the advent of TAVI and all these interventional techniques. 
double valve patients have almost disappeared from our practice here. That was much more than before. But those who come will get this minimally invasive approach and our learning curve is not, not worse than our standard. So um, we're pretty happy with that. Well, the one thing that a patient needs, and that is shown here by data from the Mayo Clinic, is a competent valve, okay? So if you have no MR recurrence, you have a good survival. If there is MR recurrence, your survival is decreased. And the other thing you need, the patient needs is a competent surgeon because the competent surgeon actually provides the competent result. And this is done by here by Joanna Chick when she was still with David Adams and they looked at, um, at the data and they showed that you have, uh, if you're not that much, if you're not, you're not that experienced, then you have a higher recurrence rate and a higher reoperation rate. So when I was in Toronto, uh, I went, I did a year with Tyrone. He told us that, you know, don't, qualify, don't uh, compromise the quality on site for a smaller incision. And that has always been the thing. But he was here with me. He visited me when I took the chair here in Jena. And uh, we actually did a minimally invasive rheumatic repair for stenosis at the time, well, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, he, we did it minimally invasively. So our repair rate now, if we have the intention to repair, I mean, we do replace, you've seen some of them. Uh, is about our intention to repair rate is 99% and we have a very high rate of minimally invasive. So now what, is, what about the more complex cases? Complex cases, if it's above P2, AML, there's uh, a general notion that they are more complex. And um, here's an AML prolapse that we fixed with the uh, cords here and this is the result. The University of Michigan has actually, they, the guys there have uh, looked at that and they, they found that there's no difference in long-term outcome for AML or PML. So if you know what you do, you can generate the same outcomes. Now, what about a Barlow? You know, in this case here, you have bileaflet prolapse. And here, in this case, I've hooked up the anterior and the posterior leaflet with cords and uh, we place a ring and then you have eventually a result like this and you have this massive amount of coaptation. And I think that is a good thing. So what happens, but if it's even more complex, in this case, we have this asymmetric jet, we have this calcification here. Um, this is, uh, uh, he, he, this guy was the dean of our jurisdictional faculty. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure. And um, this is the valve here that we can see. And you can see um, that there is a big, uh, here, I try to measure because I'm not sure whether I really need to replace this or need to uh, reuse uh, cords. But in this case, most of the time in the, in the uh, Barlow's that we see, um, the cords, the primary cords are actually long enough or short enough. And uh, in this case here, he had a, a false commissure between P1 and P2. And that I think I thought was a problem. So we closed it. And the important part was that calcification that I showed you you know, once they've done this, the calcification that I showed you um, on the, that is between P2 and P3, and you will get to see this here in a second. Here, there it is. And I'm just resecting this. So there, you know, resection is also part of the program, but it's if, uh, if it's necessary, you know. But the other thing is, we, we may even have left it because the calcium that was sort of pointing into the ventricle. Once you put your annuloplasty that tilts down and then you uh, don't see it anymore. In this case, we resected it um, and we actually eventually put a ring, didn't put any extra Gore-Tex with the ring. And then um, we have this result with a lot of regurgitation where you think, oh, that's a problem. But the end result was very nice and here, a big no no MR and uh, a lot of coaptation. So this patient is still doing fine, and that also has been ten years ago. So what about complex cases and repairability? Now others have done this already, and they randomized to mix and sternotomy in Barlow's, and they found identical results. So it's possible to do this, and this is exactly our experience. And um, I think that uh, what we've just published, and this is an, an interesting thing, and that where sort of this, my point with the antiluplasty comes into play. Because you have Barlow's that have an asympto asymmetric uh, disease pattern. There is a prolapse of one leaflet that exceeds the other, or you have a caudal rupture, and then you have an eccentric jet. 
But what about these cases here, where you have a central jet, you have billowing of both leaflets, both leaflets go above the annulus, but they still have a central jet. The geometry is fine in these valves. So our thing, our notification is that if you put a ring only, you bring your coaptation down into the ventricle. And you will notice that, and I'll ask you, please, at your next mitral valve repair or the next mitral repair that you see where an annuloplasty ring is placed only, look at how the valve functioned before and how it did afterwards. And you will hardly see in a regular, simple annuloplasty ring that was implanted that the posterior leaflet is actually moving. So we immobilize with the annuloplasty, the posterior leaflet. So by bringing this down, that may be actually the only need that we have. And if you think about this, then um, you can uh, understand Tawisak's concept of uh, bringing all the prolapses to the annular level and then put a ring and then everything is being brought down and the remaining valves coapt against each, each other and it's close. And that's the, probably one of the explanations why all these different repair concepts work. So in this case, you know, we've got this, this, this concept here. And um, so if we have a central jet, we go and think about um, placing a ring only. The only risk that you run in this case is that you have a SAM eventually, and then you have to assess the size of your ventricles. But we've done this. We've had a few SAMs because we tried and we learned. And, uh, but our long-term results uh, so far, we've got about seven years of experience here with, in my center now. And uh, we have uh, done 102 of these cases uh, published here. We've got about 110 now. We have a 30-day mortality of zero. We did, did them all minimally invasively without conversion. And we had to replace one patient because of a severe mitral endocarditis that uh, we didn't intend to repair. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude minimally invasive valve access can be the standard for the majority of valves. It, a complex repair require an individualized repair concept that can be usually generated on TEE and isolated annuloplasty may be a simple solution for a complex problem at Barlow's in selected cases. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dostan. Uh, it's a very nice presentation which complete ours and uh, we have the same rate of uh, repair and uh, the same rate of uh, mini invasive surgery in, in my institution. But uh, uh, I must confess that in France, we have not been in, able to convince all our centers. And I would say that in France, only 20% of the centers are really uh, performing uh, MIS. What is uh, the rate in, uh, in Germany? Uh, are there many centers who do this surgery or are you one of the leaders? And of course you are one of the leaders, but uh, do you have other colleagues? Yes, I mean, in Germany, you know, uh, I think Fred Moore has been the one uh, and uh, Daniel has also shown the Van Oppel paper, the initial yeah. description of the loop technique there. Uh, he has been uh, one of the pioneers of this technique. And uh, uh, since he has also been a very uh, um, leadership strong, surgeon here in Germany in general, he, he, he sent off a lot of his disciples um, to different centers. So uh, one quarter of German cardiac surgery centers uh, are run and are uh, headed by uh, a guy from Leipzig and uh, I'm one of them, right? So um, the percentage of patients that uh, receive mitral valve repair and mitral valve surgery minimally invasively in Germany is above 50% now. So um, it, the adoption is pretty good and Sorry. also I think the, uh, the, the very aggressive cardiologists here with interventional techniques uh, are also a push towards more um, minimally invasive approaches because uh, the cardiologists do a great job in uh, 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 striking fear into patients because of sternotomy. You know, they all fear sternotomy. And if you tell them, well, we don't cut the sternum, then they say, oh, uh, no problem. Then I have the surgery. So it's, uh, right. it's, it's, it's competition is a good thing in this case. Yeah, 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 it, it, uh, it leads us to do better and better. And uh, okay, so there are probably more a percentage which is more important in Germany than, uh, than in France. And uh, I have been interesting through all the different spectrum you have uh, presented. And uh, 
for instance, in we do surgery, we have the same expertise. And, and I like the technique to, to go through the right approach when you have patent coronary bypass, for instance, it's a very elegant solution. And uh, I was just surprised that you use sometimes beating heart. Why don't you use fibrillating heart from the beginning? We, we, when we do this surgery, we do exactly what you do, but we induce the fibrillation on the front. And the fibrillating heart is very efficient I mean, to protect the heart, because very often those patients, are, we do surgery, the ejection fraction is poor, sometimes they have a multiple uh, problem, let's say renal insufficiency, and we, 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 I am surprised by the quality of the protection of the myocardium by fibrillating heart. You just have to cool the patient a little bit. Then you, you, you spoke about beating heart. I don't see the place of beating heart in this situation. Can you argue on that? Uh, yes, I mean, we've done this fibrillating uh, version and the fibrillating start did, uh, in the beginning. Um, we've done this in Leipzig. Uh, I've done all the cases. That was the routine. If you did a redo from the side um, and you had no, um, and, and the aortic valve was competent, I mean, this is one of the principles for those cases, obviously, uh, because if you have uh, a significant AR, then those cases are terrible. The AR um, is a problem, yes. Right. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it, you're, you're right. I mean, if you're willing to fibrillate the heart, cool the patient to 28 degrees, um, that usually works fine. The problem is I'm, uh, you know, I'm sort of con uh, uh, consider myself a, a, also a scientist and physiologist. And if I look at the uh, oxygen supply during myocardial fibrillation, even on cardiopulmonary bypass, you know, I, I'm always afraid that there may be some ischemia and um, I've, we've had some experiences when the fibrillation was too long, then the, um, uh, then the problem uh, with ischemia is there. And the cases that I've shown you here uh, mm -hmm. are cases where there's poor ventricular function. The risk is, is in general already high. We all know that if you have a mitral regurgitation and a patient with ejection fraction of 30, that's a tricky thing. And I try to avoid any time of ischemia. And with this technique, you know, that if you open the left atrium and go with your suction directly into the ventricle, making the mitral valve completely incompetent, at that point, you're safe, even on the beating side. You don't need the fibrillation at the time because okay. you can prevent. And then we fibrillate later when we bring down the, the valve and tie it down in order to not to have air ejected into the systemic circulation. Okay. That's it. It's just a matter of time. And, but if you have a normal patient, 60% ejection fraction, a no major risk factors or so, you can start fibrillating. And, but well, you know, and we do, okay. but how, do you, how do you start fibrillating? We, because we fibrillate from the inside, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. And we, we put two, two needles on the ventricle. And okay. We All right. We use the, the, the yeah. yeah, that's another and, way. And okay, uh, I have also been interested, and it, this is important for the audience, a very simple technique to repair Barlow with just a ring. And this is really efficient. And I agree, fully agree with this technique. There is a risk of sun. And uh, do you sometimes use the Alfieri technique in order to avoid the risk of SAM? Uh, of course, you have to put a larger ring. So is this a, a, an option you, you use sometimes? Well, you know, that is an option. I haven't uh, really used it. I, for some reason, don't like it, but I'm not saying it's, it's, uh, you can't do it. It's just, I have never, I've never needed it. But the key is um, uh, you end up with much, with very large rings if you only do the aniloplasty alone anyway. So yeah. most of the time we're at 38 or 40 and there are no larger rings, at least not as far as I know. And okay. um, so there's not much option to go higher. The key is to look in the long axis view how large your ventricle is. And if your coaptation and if your ventricle is small and the coaptation is closer to the outflow tract, I'm much more inclined to hook up everything with cords, pull down the posterior leaflet, and yes. then I'm free. Then, and that we have had in this series, we've had three SAMs and we have repaired them all by reclamping and just hooking up the posterior leaflet. So we just pull the posterior leaflet down and that brings your coaptation to the, to the back posteriorly and then you're done. And so that's, okay. that's something you have to watch, definitely. Okay. May, may I ask some questions? One question oh, about the yeah. SAM, very short. Of course. I think of course. it's an amazing technique and approach. The SAM, I think uh, we found it off from time to time. And then one thing that we found that we measure the same only the anterior leaflet tissue. 
But in case with barlow and excessive tissue, the posterior is really excessive. So that is may cause the same. So instead of using only the anterior leaflet tissue at the sides, we measure all both anterior and posterior. In this way, we analyze, we found that we get two, the ring two size bigger. Okay. And then it's remarkably reduced the problem of SAM, especially when we embark on the left resection approach. What do you think about that? I'm like, yeah. No, now I, we I change the way we have approach of sizing of the ring. I fully agree. I mean, my take on aniloplasty, read, read the paper. It's uh, Boti et al. Boti is the first author that, uh, and uh, it's called Voodoo. If you look for Voodoo, you know, which Craig Miller said, it has to write, we have to write, uh, where said, where does science stop and Voodoo begin? You know, he, <laughs> he wanted it to be Voodoo because if you look at it, there's, there's no consistency in the dimensions. But you know, we've seen, uh, I don't know which, uh, who presented it, but we've had this uh, presentation where the anterior leaflet length of 26 millimeters was an important parameter for, oh yeah, Dr. Vijit, you showed it, right? The, um, uh, was an important parameter for predictability of repair. Now, if you know the dimensions, the septolateral dimension of your, so your A1, A2, P2 dimension on your ring, you know, and it, let's say, for instance, a, a 34 physio ring has an A2, P2 dimension of 28 millile millimeters, okay? So if you consider your annuloplasty to pull down the posterior annulus, to bring down your, your posterior leaflet that is just flat and you just have the anterior leaflet coapt against it, then you have 28 millimeters there. And you have, if, if your anterior leaflet is 34, then you have six millimeters more that you have for coaptation. And those you know, measurements are very difficult to make. We thought about this a lot, um, but in Leipzig, there has been the concept, if you have a 34 millimeter length on echo, which they measured, measured, then they always take a 34 ring. But the dimension there is only 28. But with the posterior leaflet that doesn't move, that's just there as a curtain, and the anterior leaflet coapting against this, we have at least six millimeters in coaptation. Yeah, yeah. And those, considerations you can make and you can come up with concepts and then that explains how repair concepts can work and that eventually explains how all these different repair concepts work yeah this is why we have this frozen posterior leaflet right okay just the last technical question from the audience to daniel uh, why do we use uh, the right and the left ground uh, for the cannulation we have a good a good reason for that if you can explain yeah i guess I guess this is this is the thing that we use from the beginning. We 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 experienced that we had less uh, risk of Lyme ischemia. I guess because when you have a good venous drainage, uh, where you have your arterial can cannulation, then you might have less Lyme ischemia. Also, I'm not sure it has been scientifically scientifically proven, but this is our experience. We are very happy with these techniques, and uh, that's it. And we also had uh, one or two cases patients who had a fistula between the artery and the vein. So if you if you split the, the, the hole in both vessels, uh, there is a less risk. Okay, now we are we are close to the end of this session. Maybe Dr. Sherian, you have uh, one comment, one, one last comment before we close the session. Yeah, uh, it is very interesting uh, to 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 you know, see the MIS experience of. Of Dawson, you know, it's amazing that uh, he's made most of it uh, go through a small incision. So that's something uh, we we've learned today. You know that uh, a lot of this is possible, and and, and I really enjoyed Dr. Tavisak's and uh, and Daniel's uh, 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 messages, and uh, we, we 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 hope that we will adopt a lot of your techniques uh, in India. And thank thank you, Dr. Shayan. Thank you, Dr. Tawiski and uh, Torsten, it was a great pleasure to share our experience with uh, this audience. And thank you to Peters, Alexandra, uh, you, you, you did a great job in, uh, in preparing this session. And uh, I hope the audience will uh, learn uh, some. Uh, and we, we, all of us, are uh, prepared to receive questions from you. And uh, 
our institution in Thailand, in uh, India, in Germany or France are, are open to the any people who want to, to ask questions or to visit us. And uh, thank you to all. It was a great pleasure to share this, uh, this moment with you, Alexandra and Peters again. Thank you for the organization. Goodbye, thank everybody. You. Thank you, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say a few words on the behalf of Figueroa Surgical. I would like to deeply thank uh, you, Professor Obadia, the moderators, and also Professor Tawistak, uh, Dr. Vijit, Dr. Greenberg, and uh, Professor Duns uh, as the speakers for, for your expertise first, and also for, for the quality of the exchange that you had today with the attendees. Um, I would just say also that uh, for the attendees that there will be a certificate of participation that will be sent next Monday with the replay of the webinars. So uh, do, do not hesitate to send your comments how we can improve uh, these webinars and uh, the next one. Uh, there is a dedicated web page for that. And uh, we plan as well to make the next webinar on, on the Aorta in the end of June. So we expect to, to see you soon. Thank you for all and have a good end of day. <laughs>